very different color. It was the same pitch, but it had a very different color. Maybe it had vibrato, maybe it was approached from above, maybe it was approached from below. This is what we mean by timbre. So uh, it's the, probably the hardest quality of music that one can uh, describe. This is a really uh, interesting uh, audience. I know many of you, we should have just probably met at the, at the bar and had a nice drink together and, and discuss this really wonderful exhibition that, uh, uh, that Vivian has put together. I want to start out by, first of all, acknowledging uh, Vivian's wonderful exhibition. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance really to, to look at uh, the works that are on exhibition, I would really highly recommend that you spend some time in the, in the galleries. I also want to uh, thank Megan Burgess for helping with uh, organizing the event and also helping me with the sound and so forth. Um, finally, uh, I want to also thank Paula Artal Isbrand, who I've gotten to know very well, who's at the <laughs> Objects uh, Conservator at the Worcester Art Museum. Um, None of this, of course, would be possible without a performer. And, and we have in the midst of uh, us today, uh, Jan Mueller Sherwas, who's uh, going to help out. The nice thing for composers is, you know, we can write the most awful sounding stuff, and great musicians like Jan make it all sound so good, you know, and, and so convincing too. So it's really a pleasure, uh, pleasure to have Jan here uh, with us today. And um, we will. T t I'll talk to you a little bit later about what the program part of the, of the event today is, is all about. Um, when uh, Vivian and I first talked about this exhibition, she told me that she was, uh, that the theme of this exhibition was this wonderful uh, scroll, Ming, Ming Wang and Yang Wefei listening to music, and, and that that was going to be the inspiration for the focus of this, uh, this wonderful exhibition, which will focus on the love story uh, between the emperor and his consort, the music of the imperial court, and also the significance of the Tang dynasty in, in later generations. And, and you know, as I started doing research and thinking about the music that, that uh, it, you know, existed in, in, in during the, the Tang period, it, you know, I, I really was uh, astounded by and impressed by, by the sort of um, cosmopolitan-ness uh, and the openness and even the very advanced outlook ab about the music itself. So it's really been a wonderful experience to, to participate in, in this event. Um, so the, as I said, the, so the centerpiece of the exhibition is Ming Wang and Yang Wefei listening to music. Uh, this scroll depicts the tragic love story between one of the last emperors of the Tang dynasty, Ming Wang, and his famous consort, Yang Wefei, as they listen to an all-female orchestra. So to, to begin with, uh, you know, when you look at this scroll carefully, it's really interesting to, to, to look at what instruments uh, this female orchestra is playing and what it may have sounded like. So I want to uh, try to give you a sense of at least some of the instruments uh, that, that uh, are represented here. It's difficult to sometimes identify all of these instruments that are being played, but you know, we will try to manifest them in, in some, some fashion in, in this talk today. Uh, the the ill-fated love between Ming Wang and Yang Wufei eventually came to represent the decline of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it has influenced many artists in China throughout history from the 9th century on, and it's also influenced the, f the first novel, for example, the Japanese tale of, of Genji. Uh, so it's a really important period both for uh, China but also for, for Asia. Uh, I want to quote for you some aspects of what music was uh, at that time. I'm, I'm quoting from an article from the Groves Dictionary of Music. Um, the few centuries of Ta Tang Dynasty existence, 618, 907, are supersaturated with brilliant imperial growth and cultural flourishings, as well as military and natural disasters. Such a rich loam of good and bad nourished the most fascinating era of music history. The more formal imperial ceremonies revi revitalized the ancient orchestras of bells, stone chimes, flutes, drums, and zithers. 
plus large bands of courtly dancers. In reality, imperial power was based perhaps less on the mandate of heaven, the notion that an emperor's right to rule was divinely confirmed, than the liberation of neighboring countries, the establishment of more thorough tax systems, and the development of more trade cities and harbors. Into all of these power sources flowed foreign goods and foreign ideas. This idea of openness, openness to other cultures, is what really um, characterizes the, the Tang. Persians, Arabs, Indians, and people from the Malay Pen Peninsula, Peninsula were found in the foreign quarters of port towns, while every trade caravan brought in masses of new faces and modes of living. There, there was hardly a tavern, and this is where it gets interesting, in the, in the capital of Chanang, now Xi'an in, in Shanxi province, that could compete without the aid of a female singer or dancer from the western regions with an accompanying set of foreign musicians. Popular tunes of the period included South India and watching the moon in Brahman Island. While beautiful exotic dancing boys or girls were ever the rage, one set of girls from Sogidiana, now Uzbekistan, won the support of the emperor. Because they were costumed, and this gets interesting too, in crimson robes, green pants, and red deerskin boots, and they twirled on top of balls. Other girls from the city today called Tashkent inspired a poet of the ninth century and so on. Uh, and it goes on to talk about how uh, they were dressed uh, and, and the, the sorts of almost burlesque-like uh, routines that these dancers and musicians performed. Uh, a study of the lithe bodies, the flying sleeves on tang, clay dancing figurines is even more compelling proof of the style of the era. So this, you know, this sort of suggests a really vital and, and important uh, uh, and certainly flourishing musical and dance culture, which would probably give Shakira and Beyonce a run for their money. You know? <laughs> so, in addition to the commercial musical enterprises of the Tang Dynasty, there was another equally extensive system under government supervision. Emperor Zhuang Zhuang seemed particularly keen on music and took full advantage of the various musical tributes or captives sent to him by all the nations of Asia. This plethora of sounds was further enriched by the special area in Chanang called Peter Gar Pear Garden, in which hundreds of additional musicians and dancers were trained and which the emperor himself was most active. Such trainees were often female. They followed in an earlier tradition of court girls whose basic duties were to entertain distinguished guests. And so on, uh, it goes, the article goes on to talk about how the emperor himself uh, or, or try to organize the many, many styles of music from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, India, Korea, and so on that existed at the time and, and created from, increased the number of categories of music from two to three. The, the earlier period uh, saw music in terms of essentially two large categories. One was called uh, ritual music, music that was able, for instance, to up uplift and, and encourage and uh, help moral development. And the other was called vernacular music, which was um, more, um, I suppose you, you think of that as more uh, popular or folk-like. We also think of music, at least musicologists and ethnomusicologists, think of music uh, in terms of uh, classifications based either on literate music versus music in oral tradition, or a music that is more complex versus music that's more simple. None of these really work out ultimately. Uh, but, but the idea of music as a, as a source for uplifting and transcending the mundane is a really interesting idea, both in, in uh, Indian, Indian philosophy and as well as in, in Chinese philosophy. I, I certainly find that very interesting. Uh, so what was the Tang? like, what was the Tang Dynasty like? Well, there were all of these musical practices going on at the same time. There was clearly a lot of collaboration and, and cooperation and synthesis. Uh, and there was also an effort to, to maintain the indigenous and, and pure forms of the music. I want to just go back to this painting and, and try to decipher some of the instruments. Uh, if you look at the, the scroll, this beautiful scroll, uh, you will see that it's made up of a bunch of stringed instruments, 
um, both lute-like, like the second instrument on the right, which is called a pipa, uh, wind mm. instruments, like the third instrument on the right, which is a sheng, for example, which is actually pronounced as shung, uh, flutes, and, and on the bottom you'll see the, the chin, which you're going to hear in this lecture and also in the reception, uh, various percussion instruments like the clapper, a clavier-like instrument, and, and the uh, two drums at the bottom. So it's difficult, you know, Jan, maybe you can help us here, you know, difficult to really realize what would the sound of this orchestra be? It's, it's odd the way in which the, the players are, are uh, placed. Usually you, you would have all the percussion instruments in the back, for instance. Uh, but it, it has all, uh, all the important types, different types of, um, of musical instruments. The only, only one that I don't see, and uh, maybe I'm missing that, is, an, is a bowed instrument called the air hoo. But the, you see the lute variety, the pipa right on the top, the second from the top. Uh, you see the zither-like instrument, the chin, which is at the bottom left. Uh, you see a very interesting instrument that's a third from the right on top called the shung, which is essentially a blown reed instrument, called, uh, much like a mouth organ, um, and of course many kinds of flutes. Uh, it is interesting to compare this orchestra with a, a Japanese orchestra that you would see in the Gagaku court in Japan about a couple of hundred years later than, than this, um, around 800, uh, around 800, 900 AD, in which uh, many of these instruments, slightly transformed, are also do appear. The shung, for example, and again, that's the third instrument on the right, on the top. Uh, for instance, that instrument becomes transformed into an instrument that's known as sho in gagaku. Uh, the pipa-like instrument in gagaku is called shamisen. The sheng and its close relative, the ch cheng, uh, which is um, the sort of inspiration for the Japanese koto and so on, uh, in many other instruments like that in Thailand and in South Vietnam, I mean in Vietnam and uh, in Korea uh, is also seen in this, in this wonderful scroll. So what would this music sound like? I would be thrilled to hear that uh, played. Um, it's difficult to reconstruct this music, um, but it, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because all the, the, the various uh, varieties of instruments, i.e. string, percussion, blown, i.e. flutes, etc., are represented. The only type that is not in this, uh, in this orchestra is, a, is brass instruments. So, so uh, I wanted to talk basically about two instruments that are really important in this, in this uh, period and in Chinese music in general. It's certainly two instruments that I find very, uh, very inspiring. So this is uh, the instrument that uh, Vivian mentioned. It's called the chin. Uh, historical accounts talk about this instrument as having originated hundreds of years even before the Tang Dynasty. There is a sense that this instrument was performed, played by um, Confucius, although there's no real evidence to prove that. Um, it's, as you can see, it's made up of seven, seven strings made usually of silk. Um, it's tuned in a pentatonic scale. If you try to imagine the piano, it would be the black notes of the piano. So do, re, fa, sol, la, do, re, for example, that those would be the seven notes of the, of the scale. And um, it is a co very complicated instrument. So not many, many, many people play this instrument. Uh, you won't hear, uh, for even, even in China, you won't hear this music, this instrument played as, as much as, as the pipa, for example. Um, if you look carefully, you will see nodes on the, uh, on the right-hand side. These, these are places where the performer is uh, going to stop the strings to get what are known as harmonics. Uh, talk about that in a little bit more, more in, in a second. Uh, it's a highly sophisticated and developed instrument and has its own uh, unique uh, notation system. The, the notation system is essentially a tablature notation system, not unlike the tablature notation system, for example, in a lute 
or um, guitar notation. What the tablature notation shows is where to place one's fingers to produce the sound. It doesn't tell you how the, what the sound is, unlike, for example, some other notation systems that graphically represent whether, whether the sound is higher or lower. But the chin has a very sophisticated and complex notation system. The only um, idiosyncratic thing about the chin notation is that durations are not indicated. So scholars have had to um, recreate the, or imagine or, or could reconceive the, the, the notation in terms of what the durations are. Um, so what's interesting about this instrument? This is a very far-reaching instrument. It's very modern and some of the techniques that are used in this instrument uh, resemble what composers uh, in the late 20th century um, have been fascinated with, i.e. the color of sound. I'll also come back to that in a second. But going back to the notation, the notation suggests how each note needs to be played, both in the left and right hand, how it has to be plucked, whether there's a slide into the note, whether it's a harmonic, whether there's a vibrato, whether there's a there is a um, glissando into the note, etc. These these sorts of um, um, definitions are have generally to do with the color of the note rather than the actual note itself. And it is this fascination with sound color, what we call timbre in music, which is really what makes this music really, really uh, interesting. So here is an example of a piece which is called Variations on Plum Blossom, uh, played by this really wonderful uh, chin player on a UNESCO recording that is now not available uh, a, 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 a on CD or anything. You'd have to really uh, look hard to find it. But this is a piece that I have lived with for many years and I, I keep coming back to it. I, I find it uh, very interesting and very fresh even now. Great. So you at least get some sense of it. It goes on for another four or five minutes. Uh, again, this is a piece that I have been listening to since I was in graduate school, so that's about 35 years. And every time I listen to it, I still find it quite fresh. And the reason is, uh, I'm sure you noticed that, that when the performer was playing the same note uh, in succession, so for example, when you play the note C, and then he repeated the note, the second time when you heard the same note, it had a very different color. It was the same pitch. 
but it had a very different color. Maybe it had vibrato, maybe it was approached from above, maybe it was approached from below. This is what we mean by timbre. So uh, it's the, probably the hardest quality of music that one can uh, describe. You can easily describe pitch. Everybody can understand pitch, melody, harmony. It's easy to describe rhythm. But it's very difficult to describe color. So for instance, if I were to ask you to describe the difference between a trumpet playing the note F and a clarinet playing the note F, to somebody who has never heard a clarinet or a trumpet, what would you say? It would be difficult to explain. You might say, well, the clarinet is hollow, the trumpet is bright, they're playing the same note. But that doesn't quite get to it. This notion of color is something that doesn't really get explored in, in Western music, certainly, until you get to the 20th century. Uh, that's not to say that Brahms and Haydn and Mozart and Mahler did not, were not interested in how the orchestra sounded. Of course they were, but their principal focus, take for example Bach, the principal focus is on counterpoint and on pitch, on rhythm on the temporality of the music. It's not, in, fr in fact, if you think about our, uh, The Art of the Fugue by Bach, which is one of his most famous pieces, he doesn't even say which instruments should play it. It doesn't matter. You can play it on a string by st with strings, you could play it on wind instruments, you could play it on the piano, and it doesn't destroy the, the, the basic structure of the piece. Whereas, compare that to, say, Stravinsky's Le Sacre du Printemps, and you can't, cannot imagine playing it for uh, you know, a flute choir or something like that. It would be ridiculous, right? So, because the, the, the notion of color is very important to Stravinsky, and in fact, it becomes really important to, to Schoenberg, who, who writes about something uh, called Klangfarben melody, which is tone color melody, the idea of creating a melody out of color. So imagine a piece of music which just has one note played by many different piece of, uh, instruments of the orchestra. There are composers actually who have done that in the 20th but that doesn't happen in, in Western music until the 20th century. That's really remarkable. So I'll come back to this piece in a few minutes because I made an, uh, a new version of this piece for, for solo cello, which Jan is going to play for you. Uh, in which you know the idea was well how do you how do you translate these really wonderful sonorities of the chin which is actually an orchestra in itself you know it has all these possibilities it can play low it can play high it can play harmonics it can play vibrato and so on. it cannot bow so that's the nice thing about the cello but also it can the cello cannot do many of the things that the the chin can do so how does one one take this idea this idea of color exploration of similar pitches or same pitch and then then make a piece out of it so we'll get to that. So the second, the second example that I want to play for you is a piece that I composed for um, a fantastic uh, player from China who I've been collaborating with, whose name is Wu Tong. He plays the instrument Shung, which I already pointed out to you, which, is, which you see in the, in the scroll. And, and I wrote a piece uh, called Kala Chakra for him and also an ensemble, including Yan and the, the tabla player Sandeep. So it's you know, sort of fast forwarding in a sense, you know, uh, going back to the tank. The, the tank is very much part of this because as you will see, uh, the instrument is being used in its, yeah, this is it. So let's, let's listen a little bit to this. <laughs> Oh. 
Okay, you get an idea. This, this is really a modern use of, of, of the shog. Uh, so this piece is called Kala Chakra, which is a Sanskrit word. Kala means time, chakra means cycle, or cycles of time, or time cycles. Uh, it's also a very important word in Tibetan Buddhism and refers to a particular style, particular type of uh, philosophy that has to do with meditation and so forth. Uh, you can look, that's another talk, that's another drink somewhere down the road. And so you, but by all means, look, look it up. So Wutong is an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, shoe player. And uh, he is kind of like the Justin Bieber of China because he also does, he, he also does, as you can tell, you know, rock and roll and so forth. But he, he's, he's trained uh, in, in traditional uh, playing of the shung and is a wonderful, one of the most wonderful musicians that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And when Vivian and I started talking about this, we were thinking of, of, of a performance that would include him. Uh, so you'd, you'd hear the, the wide range of, uh, of the possibilities that he has. Uh, with the instrument and also both the traditional and the more contemporary ways in which he explores, uh, explores this. We were thinking actually of a concert that would involve Wutong and then Yan, and it, that didn't work out, so Vivian, maybe another time we'll do that. But I wanted to play you this uh, just so you get a sense of, uh, of uh, his, his uh, you know, amazing musicianship, but also the, the possibilities of this instrument, just to tell you a little bit about this instrument. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a mouth organ, and it, as I mentioned earlier, it has influenced many uh, instruments in East as well as Southeast Asia that are like that. The, the one that uh, is very important to, to mention is the in instrument called, called the show, which is also used in gagaku music. Uh, in, in the Japanese gagaku music, it's also court music. It's made up of something like 36 bamboo uh, reeds or, or pipes, and it, its, um, its modern version is chromatic, so you can play both the eastern scales, pentatonic scales, as well as chromatic scales, as, as Wu Tong is doing there. Um, so, you know, Im images of the Shung appear as early as 5000 BC, and it is both a solo instrument, and as you can see, it's also a polyphonic instrument. So it, it can play chords, it can play two lines, as he was doing in the beginning, uh, and so forth. Um, and again, like I mentioned, in the show in the Japanese gagaku is something different than, than this instrument. The way it is used is also very interesting. So um, the, at least I hope, to, hope that gave you a sense of, of these two traditional instruments and the wide range of colors, timbres, that they are capable of. So that is sort of, for me, the sort of takeaway from the, the scroll in terms of how it has influenced my own music. Now I want to turn to, to Jan and go to the second part of this concert, which is, which is we want to go to uh, some actual music making. So you hear, so. So the program is made up of uh, three pieces. Uh, the first is a piece called Flying. It's from Four Moods for Solo Cello by Chen Zhao Shang, who is a Chinese-American composer who lives in the Boston area and who has known Yan for, for many, many years. And he may even be here. Is he here by any chance, Yan? Do you know? If, okay. So uh, his piece, that, the piece that you're going to hear Yan play, his, his piece, is very interesting because it's, it's in the much more of a modern, modern style, but it's based on Chinese folk tunes, uh, traditional Chinese folk tunes, but he, he manipulates them in very interesting ways. And the techniques he uses of the cello that you will hear are similar to the techniques you're going to hear for the rest of the concert, i.e. extended techniques using harmonics and various kinds of bowing and so forth. I'll just read you a couple of uh, lines from his uh, this uh, piece. This solo cello piece is each movement reflects some of the composer's moods, such as fury, imagination, meditation, etc. The first movement, flying, is a very lyrical and poetic piece. The main theme is, is very Chinese and draws on folk-like fragments from different Chinese folk songs. But the rhythm and phrases of the piece are asymmetrical, i.e. modern. This approach makes the theme uh, memorable, or at least singable, and yet has enough complexity for the modern year. Jan.
Prince on Plum Blossom. Um, w when I was thinking of making this transcription from chin to cello, uh, I looked at uh, and listened very carefully to, to the music and wh what became clear is that there was going to be an issue of tuning. The, the tuning system that is used in Chinese music is very different than the, the tempered system that we use in Western music. So fortuit fortuitously, it, it so happens that the cello can play in, in both these systems because it does not have frets. A guitar would be less flexible, for instance. So what is the, the system that the Chinese use? It's, it's based on, the, on tuning the, the perfect fifth perfectly. Uh, there are many cultures that have chosen to use the fifth. The first uh, actually are the Chinese. In Indian culture also the fifth is used perfectly. Pythagoras talks about the perfect fifth also as the most beautiful interval. He talks about the music of the spheres, for instance, and the, the interval of the fifth as defining the way in which that music happens very, very quickly without getting into the weeds. If you took, made perfect fifths from the starting on the notes C, for example, and you went C, G, D, A, B, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, A sharp, E sharp, B sharp, which really should be the same as C, you actually end up on a note that's slightly higher than the C. And that difference between the C and the slightly sharper C, we call that a Pythagorean comma. <laughs> and that Pythagorean comma is the magical interval. That is the interval of the universe. That also happens to be the interval that the Chinese like to use in their tuning system. So the question was, and if you listen very carefully, you would have noticed that the fifths might have sounded slightly sharper to you in, in the performance compared to the fifth of the, of the piano. Our, our so-called equal tempered fifths are actually slightly sharper. So the question was, how do you translate that into, into the cello? And Jan does a, a real beautiful job of, of slightly mistuning some of the notes he plays, mistuning in the, in the Western sense, but they're perfectly in tune in, in, the, in a real sense. Uh, that was one thing. The other thing is the, the various kinds of pizzicati that you hear in the, the chin piece. How do you translate that? Well, uh, some of the bowing techniques that you will hear in, and also plucking techniques you here in this piece that we played by Jan, all tries to replicate that. But then the cello also has the possibility of playing arco with the bow. So that's a, a world that the chin doesn't have. So how, then how do we incorporate that? When does that happen? The one thing that's really interesting about the traditional piece, if you find it online or ever go back and listen to it, is that there are, besides this idea that the chin is actually an orchestral, the orchestra of instruments, that there is also this very interesting time organization in the piece. If you listen to the piece, you will find that it's very meditative, but it also has a certain temporal structure in the, in the form that is quite unlike anything else that I've heard. So Jan's going to play the, the variations on Plum Blossom. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
I have told you that he does magic with the cello, right? It, it sounds like several instruments as he's playing it. Uh, the last piece uh, that we're going to play for you is called Anuswara. It's back to the future in the sense that, you know, it, this may have been a piece that uh, the emperor or his court might have listened to. A South Indian musician maybe walked in with a veena or a sarangi or some instrument from China and played this this piece for him. So, of course, I'm, I'm asking you to play a, a mind game here. Uh, this piece is, is called Anuswara and it was written uh, for Jan many years ago. And it's part of a series of pieces called Anuswara Prism 1, Anuswara Prism 2, etc. Um, which was inspired by the sort of painterly approach that, that many of my favorite painters take. And I had never written a series of pieces that were all related to a single theme, but the idea was to write several pieces that were related to a single single musical idea, but each prism, each, each variation, each piece would be slightly different and, and more and more abstract from the one written before until you get to just the, the very, a very basic outline of what the initial inspiration was. For example, I'm thinking about Joseph Alpers or uh, Virginia just today sent me, I don't know, she just left, okay. Uh, Virginia Lerbegan, who's an art historian, just today sent me some, some um, paintings of the water lilies of, of uh, Monet, for example, same thing, the idea of painting the same object but with different light so that it becomes different every time until finally maybe the light disappears and it becomes just the, the outline of the lily. Uh, so that was the idea behind this piece, Anuswar, oh there's Virginia. So, uh, the, uh, Anuswaram in Sanskrit means after sound. So the idea is it's, 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 a, it's an exercise that's used in meditation. So if, if you, in your first lesson in one style of meditation uh, that has to do with sound, uh, goes something like this, that the teacher will play you a sound of a bell, for instance, usually a, a sound that is not infinite. Uh, obviously. So it, it would be a sound, for example, a sound of a bell, and, and you are supposed to remember every detail of that sound in your mind. And you keep repeating that exercise until finally you can just listen to, to, the, uh, to, you, to your brain, to your mind, and hear the sound. So the, the idea is to, in the process of going through that, one goes through several, st several stages of, of meditation and, and movement from one chakra to the next and so forth. But anyway, the important thing for this piece is that it is actually a meditation. So feel free to zone out, close your eyes if you want. Uh, there will be a drone uh, and just follow the pro pro process, uh, the process of after sound.
questions or comments or and Jan, we're happy to answer any questions. Yes. Um, did you um, notate the plum blossoms for him? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Them and everything? Absolutely, yeah. yes. And yes. all the, did you make up your own? Symbols and things, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, yes. So it's, it's such a beautiful thing just to interact with silence, but actually not silence. <laughs> and Jan, does that change in the space that you're playing? Absolutely, yeah. uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you, I mean, you're welcome to take a look at the score, which is very, very meticulous, uh, the way how Shirish notated things, but he did that allowing a certain um, freedom within that. Um, the hardest thing is to be free when you have no limits. It's so, freedom is then almost inhibiting. But as soon as you have something very complex and you look for freedom in the complexity, it's liberating, and it's uh, it's it's a beautiful thing to play and be a play with a piece. It's not that you are bound by it anymore, but it actually frees you up. I mean, one more question, then we should have a drink. <laughs> those kind of sounds would come from the cello. I mean, if I close my eyes, it sounded like, but even, but not a chin, but uh, so, it's, something it's, much it's, more. <laughs> it's, it's, I had initially yeah. thought of doing yeah. that, uh, arranging it for an orchestra. It's like a string orchestra. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't have a string orchestra, so I said, well, let's think cello, you know? And, and when you start thinking about the cello as an orchestra, which is sort of what you have to do, then you get this, uh, this possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much. And thank you.